Hello and welcome to Let's Talk with Bishop R.C. Blakes. R.C. is an author, empowerment teacher and the proud pastor of the New Home Ministries of New Orleans, Louisiana and Houston, Texas. His message circles the globe. His conversational and candid approach to challenging content makes him a relevant voice to all generations. Get ready for a life-changing transformational conversation. Well, hello, family. This is your pastor, R.C. Blakes, Jr., and I am always thrilled to be able to share with you. Um, I'd love for you to invite someone to come in and to be a part of our lesson for today in this Bible study. Um, I want to look at something that I've dealt with before, but I think it's um, the subject matter. Nothing new under the sun. What has been will be, the Bible declares. And um, as I look at it from generation to generation, and I've been teaching the word of God for a whole generation, really. And I'm um, looking at how things are, you know, coming back around and how we're looking now at my children, you know, my generation's children and our grandchildren. And we're starting to see where some of the, the sins of our generation um, was duplicated, has been duplicated, and maybe even um, expanded upon in our children's generation. And then we see our grandchildren coming, you know, coming onto the scene. And in, in some cases, we're starting to see where they're picking up on some of the same stuff. And, you know, the body of Christ, we call this uh, generational, a generational curse. So when I think about this and I look at the realities of how this stuff passes down, you know, from uh, one generation to the next, my mom and I some years ago went to um, California and we got a chance to sit down and we got a chance to talk with uh, her uncle. I think he would be considered my great uncle. And... Um, he was at that time he was in his 90s and he was just sharing some things with me that uh, kind of blew my mind because some of the things that I thought originated with me and my generation I find out that two generations before me they had already started this stuff they had already you know engaged in a whole lot of the stuff that you know specifically sinful activity immorality that I thought was originated in my generation um, my oldest daughter and I had a real candid conversation recently. She started reading uh, my book, Imperfectly Holy. And it's really, that book is really, um, it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't written to be commercial per se. I didn't write that book for it to, you know, sell thousands of copies a month. But I wrote that book to really leave my message in the earth relative to how my life changed. But she, back to the point, she was reading the book and she started learning things about my life that she never realized before. And she's 41 years old at this point. And I'm certain she doesn't mind me saying that. Um, you know, and the things that uh, she learned were like um, an eye opener to her relative to how I am, how I became the man that I am and some of my idiosyncrasies and some of my insecurities and why those things exist. But I inherited a lot of the stuff from generations that came before me. Now, when we inherit the sins of our foreparents, we also inherit their consequences. And that's the thing my generation tries to communicate to uh, this present generation. You can, you can take on my habits, you can take on my, um, you know, proclivities, but you, you'll also take on my consequences. We take on the consequences from generation to generation. There, there's a reason that children tend to struggle with the same deficiencies as parents. You know, it's like poverty, for instance. Uh, poverty almost seems to be generational. Now, of course, I understand that it is um, 
uh, systematic in a lot of cases, you know, people don't want to deal with that reality, but it is the reality, especially in the United States of America, that there are certain people that are marginalized because the system works against those people. But then there are other cases and, and a lot of them where there are some families that struggle with poverty from generation to generation and one or two generations had great opportunities to come out. But they were, they were stuck in the, the mindset, the generational curse of the previous generation. And you know, I think if you, if you look at that whole concept of generational curses, uh, it, it, you know, if you look at it from a, um, a secular perspective, it, it, it many times can be equated to social conditioning. You know, we become what we see. It's hard to be what I've never seen. And so if I've seen something in abundance, that thing usually becomes my, my rhythm, you know, my focus, my forte, so to speak. Now, uh, Deuteronomy 5 and 9 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Behaviors, consequences. God says to Israel, if you participate in idol worship, the consequences are going to be felt all the way down to the third and fourth generations. So this passage describes what has been termed as a generational curse. So many families are operating from a cursed position today because of things that were started generations ago. Now, I don't mean to jump ahead of my message, but uh, my father, the late prophet Robert Charles Blake Sr., uh, because of the shift God made in his life, he really left the polar opposite upon my brother and I. He left generational blessing. And when I say that, I'm not talking about he left us a whole lot of money. No, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. The blessing transcends material things or monetary value. But he left us mindsets. He left us examples of righteousness that serve today to steer us in the direction because we we walk in his direction of righteousness. We, we are also in our generation um, reaping the same consequences or benefits of blessing. But a def you know, let me give you a definition of a curse. A curse is uh, a consistent pattern of negative consequences. That's a curse. It is a consistent pattern of negative consequences. As a pastor, I get a chance to, to deal with a lot of people and I've seen, I've, seen the, I've seen the parents, I've seen the children, I've seen the grandchildren. I've baptized the parent, I've baptized the child, I've baptized the grandchild. That's how long I've been doing this. And in some cases, I've seen where there is a consistent pattern of negative consequences that moves from one generation to the next. You have the generation that started out with me, full of excuses, full of game, you know, full of con, and they raise up children full of game, full of con, full of excuses, always struggling, always coming from the bottom. You can, you can gift wrap an opportunity and, and have FedEx to deliver it to their door, you know, and they won't even receive it or open it up. And then I see their children coming along. You can already see in these little kids, full of game, full of con, a lot of excuses, don't want to take accountability. That's a what? That's a curse. That's a consistent pattern of negative consequences because one generation models unrighteousness before the next generation. And then the next generation models the same thing before the oncoming generation. But all of us to, you know, from one degree uh, to another are struggling 
with things we inherited. In many cases, we don't know we picked it up from four generations ago. Like I tell you about, I had that sit down with my great uncle. I didn't realize that that stuff was a part of my family on both sides, on both sides, might I add, you know, long before I was even a thought, even before my mother and father were a thought. Now, there are four things that are consistently passed down from one generation to the next, consistently passed down from one generation to the next. Um, just making certain that Mike is in place. Number one is biology. Old I get, the more people say, oh, you look just like your dad. There was a time I, I saw nothing about me that looked like my dad. Now when I wake up in the morning, morning and look in the mirror, I'm almost scared because it's like my dad looking back at me. You know what I'm saying? The biology, man, it doesn't lie. Uh, my oldest daughter, Venetra, she's a much lighter version than me, but she's my twin for the most part. It's crazy when I look at it and I think about it. She's my twin. Um, psychology. We, we, we consistently pass down from, you know, one extent to another, we pass down psychology. Poverty many times is a psychology. Wealth is a psychology. Health and well-being is a psychology. If that is modeled before us, that will be passed down to us. We pass down sociology. And we pass down theology, you know. This is, these things are pretty much consistent across the board, you know. One generation passes these things down. Now, when we inherit behavior and beliefs, we also reap the consequences of that behavior. What we pass down will either amount to a generational blessing or a generational curse. This is why the Bible admonishes the parent to, you know, train up the child in the way he or she should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. Doesn't mean that they won't stray, but it means that you have passed down a psychology, a theology that is uh, adhered to their consciousness. And when they steer away from the paths of righteousness that you've laid down, they won't be able to participate in sin without the consequence of having be or being grieved. And at some point, the spirit of God will use that hook of grief to to reel them back to the path sooner or later. They're coming back to the path like the prodigal son. And I speak that over your family because some of you have children who are on a path that um, does not mirror anything you raised them to be on. Well, you did your part. You modeled it. You taught it. You trained them. Now you have to trust God to direct them and lead them in the spirit of God. I hear, I hear the Holy Spirit saying the spirit of God is interrupting, uh, even destroying the framework of this life, a lifestyle that they've adopted that does not amount to righteousness. And God says, I'm bringing them back to the path like I did the prodigal son. You know, he went off into the far country and did his thing. But when he came back to himself, Back to what his father modeled and taught. He, he returned with a repentant heart. Now, there's always a cause for every effect. Where there is a persistent negative consequence, there is a cause. There is a cause for that consequence. All you got to do is just, just look beneath the surface there's a cause, there's a reason that things are happening the way they're happening. And in Proverbs 26 and 2, it says, As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. Wherever there's a curse, a consistent pattern of negative results, there is a cause. Where there's no cause, a curse will not come. There's no such thing as a curse without a cause. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, 
it says, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither had this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. Because all things being equal, the disciples are saying, well, you know, usually there's a generational cause for some adverse impact or effect on the next generation. Jesus says, well, in this case, it had nothing to do with anything his parents did. But this man was picked out that God might get glory through his life. But typically, where there's a curse, there is a cause. Now, how are family curses developed? Because, you know, we, we all pray for our families, man. My God, we all pray for our families. And, you know, I hear people that, um, that talk about they want children. They don't know what they're really asking for. Because when you're asking for a child, um, biological, adopted, however, when, it, when you're asking for a child, what you're asking for is to pour all of your heart into an individual while they are developing and, and need you to survive, only to raise them to a point where they become independent. And when they become independent, they may very well honor you. They may very well respect your God. or They may very well forget about you and walk away from your God. And it doesn't matter what direction they go in, your heart is always tied to them. Now you may, you may make the choice, you know, for your own well-being to just kind of let them go and let them do their thing, but it, it still, it still impacts you. So we're all, you know, all of us for the most part are praying for our families. We're praying for our children. We're praying for our grandchildren. We're praying for those that are, are to come even when we're no longer on the planet. But the question is, how are these generational curses developed? How are these family curses developed? Well, number one, a little different look at this. When a father, in particularly a father, when a father partici participates in any ungodly behavior, he makes it lawful for certain spirits to become a part of that family. When you look at Adam, the father of the human race, he transferred a general, generational curse of sin upon all mankind to follow him. Adam did that. We were born sinners because of what, what Adam initially did. All men are born in sin, shape, and in iniquity because of what Adam did. The first man was born righteous in right standing with God. But because of his behavior, he transferred a generational curse onto every man to follow. Romans 5 and 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned, speaking of Adam. So number one, when a father participates in any ungodly behavior, he makes it lawful for certain demonic spirits to become a part of that family. He, he opens the door because he's the gatekeeper. The, the man is the gatekeeper. He's the covering. That's, that means more, brother, than walking around talking about you the boss and trying to turn your wife into a slave. That means you, you and I are the spiritual gatekeepers. Nothing comes in or out except we allow it. The patriarch of a family creates demonic access to his family in the areas of his sinful and moral shortcomings. Now, let me show you how that works um, in, a, in, a, in a real transparent um, illustration of my own family. And, and I'm free in doing this because my father told his own testimony. When I was a young kid, my father was um, a drinking Baptist preacher. Dad would preach on Sunday mornings and he, would, he and his buddies would get, he and, and some of the biggest preachers in the city would get drunk on Sunday night have parties and everything else. 
And there was a certain age I was getting to where I knew how to mix their drinks. I knew how to mix everybody's drinks. And in my mind at this age, I'm thinking, you know, I guess I'm around 11. I'm thinking, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to, um, I'm going to start drinking when I get a chance. As soon as I get a chance, I'm going to start drinking. Because that was what was being modeled before me. The, the patriarch, the strong man of the family was embracing this behavior. And so um, one day I was mixing the drinks. One day I was mi mixing the drinks and there was just a little bit, just a little bit, I think it was uh, old granddad. There was just a little bit left in the bottle. And I turned that bottle up and I said, I'm gonna taste this today. And I let that little bit drain down in my throat. And it felt like somebody poured gasoline down my throat, taste like gasoline and like somebody lit a match. But even beyond that, I still had this mindset that I was gonna be open to drinking. And then it wasn't long after that God touched my father, shifted his life, delivered him. He became a, you know, a spirit filled man of God that walked his talk. And it was it was at the perfect time because it shifted my it shifted my way of thinking from that unrighteous example to that righteous example. Now, um, this is why a woman must know the man that fathers her kids. He has, the, he has the thermostat of the children's, children's future in him. They will inherit a blessing or a curse from him. So you have to stop thinking about, is a man good enough for you? You have to ask yourself now, is this, the, is this man the model of what I would like to see my children, my sons and my grandsons become? The man is the strong man of the family. If he engages in morality, if he engages in righteousness, he then opens the door for demonic spirits to play around in his family, in his lineage. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, it says, but if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of of God is come unto you or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house so the father is a strong man of the family whatever the devil gets through the man will enter into the family on some level because the man is the strong man even if he's a weak man a woman that breeds with a man of embedded weaknesses is sentencing their offspring to more of the same. Because all that plagues society can be traced back to generations of men who have failed their families spiritually and morally. When the man has died, those same spirits find a way to manifest in the lives of that man's seed. And even those who were simply submitted to that man. Stuff even begins to show up in adopted children. Matthew chapter 12, 43 uh, through 45 says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. When the issues of the father manifest in the sons, 
it's always more intense. David was a womanizer. Uh, he had a son. I uh, forget the boy's name. But he had a son that was a rapist, raped his own sister. He had another son by the name of Solomon that had women from all around the world because whatever's in the father will manifest in the sons at a greater level. David demonstrated, again, sexual perversion before his children and in Israel. And he invited and made a place for the spirit of sexual perversion to camp out in his family. Now, number two, number two, uh, how are families cursed or how, how is the cursing of families developed? When sin, number two, when sin and immorality are modeled in a family, the members become conditioned to that behavior. It becomes a family stronghold. The members develop a tolerance for it. You know, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5, it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. A stronghold is an unrighteous mindset that avoids the will of God and promotes habits and behavior that dishonor God and destroy the body and the soul. Strongholds are mostly conditioned mindsets. So a parent must be aware that everything they do is establishing a system. I remember many years ago, I went to, uh, I guess it was the bless a house or something like that. And when I walked in, I was a young pastor. I walked in, there was a little baby. I, it was, you know, this baby had to be maybe three. They're holding a little child. And this little child was just using so much, so much profanity. And I'm talking about, you know, big words, big four letter words, you know, and the, 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 the adults there were like, oh, we don't know what happened. We don't know where that come from. In the name of Jesus, we don't know where that come from. That ain't the way we live around here. Well, that was a lie. That child's not around there using that kind of language. But for the fact that they're around there using that kind of language. This stuff is what? Learned behavior. Learned behavior. You know, you, 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 you cannot tell your children, do as I say, not as I do. Your children are going to honor what you do more than what you say. In 1 Kings 15, 1 through 3, it says, Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Mekah, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. When the children model the sin, they reap the same consequences from generation to generation. And then number three, when a curse resides in a family for generations without being addressed, it becomes normal to that family. Jail, normal. Poverty, Normal profanity, normal sexual perversion, normal Romans 1, 28 through 32 says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate. Deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parent, parents without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. 
And then 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. When a curse resides in a family for generations without being addressed, it becomes normal to that family. Now let's move into uh, the next level of this teaching. How to break these family or generational curses. How do we begin to break this thing? Because it's not enough for us to just sit around and talk about this is our reality. This is what we're dealing with. How do we begin to break this? The cure for a generational curse has always been, will always be, there has to be a generation that arises and repents. When Israel turned from idols to serve the living God again, the curse was broken and God saved them. Just jot down and read in your leisure, Judges 3 and 9, 15, uh, 3 and 15, 1 Samuel 12, 10 and 11. Just read those. Because when Israel turned from, you know, idol worship and returned to the living God, the curse was broken. Now, yes, God promised to visit Israel's sins upon the third and fourth generations, but in the very next verse, he promised that he would show love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. If you go to Exodus uh, chapter 20, verses 5 and 6, it says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me. Verse six, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Repentance is the key to breaking generational curses. You see, it's, there's a link from, from one generation to the next, to the next. Well, whatever generation decides to repent breaks that the link of that stronghold and so now the generation following them they are left you know dangling because there's no longer any legal demonic bond so they're they're left to figure it out for themselves in terms of this behavior because now satan no longer has legal access to them through the generation that came before them you need to repent in your generation. Stop worrying about your children. There's some things that happened in your generation that you need to repent for. There are things that I see, and this, this happens more than you realize. There are things that I see, you know, in, in my children sometimes and in my grandchildren. And sometimes I'm like pointing the finger. But then when I stop and I step back and I look at myself, I'm like, you know, that's really just another version of some of the stuff you did. And I have to what? I have to repent. Now, let's see something here. Uh, Exodus uh, 20. Exodus 25 and 6. Thou shalt not bow down thyself. Okay, no, not there. Um, let me make this statement. God's grace will last a thousand times longer than his wrath. For the Christian who is worried about a generational curse, the answer is salvation through Jesus Christ because a Christian then one that is really saved becomes a new creation second Corinthians 5 and 17 says therefore if any man be in Christ he is a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new salvation through Jesus Christ you see you're gonna need more if you start talking about breaking uh, generational curses, you're going to need more than religion. 
Y'all out here with all this religion, talking about Baptists, Methodists, Church of God in Christ. Yeah, a whole lot of folk that are religious that are not saved. And religion has no power. You're going to need a real, authentic relationship with Jesus Christ to become a what? New creature. How can a child of God still be under a curse? Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The answer is you got to have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. You break that. You break that stronghold of that curse through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe we would do better with our children if we um, spent less time pointing our dirty fingers at them and our grandchildren and spent more time trying to steer them into a, an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ, because it's that relationship with Jesus Christ that eliminates the capacity for curses to just, you know, sit upon any generation. Uh, let's see. Uh, I read Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation in them which are in Christ. Jesus I did, who walked not after the flesh but after the spirit. The cure for generational curse is always repentance of the sin in question. Faith in Christ and a life consecrated to the Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by, transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Consecration. Present your bodies. Now, all of this is personal. This is something you need to do. When my father presented his body a living sacrifice, he shifted the mindset of my brother and I. Rather than transferring that curse, he transferred that blessing of righteousness. Because again, the man is the gatekeeper. Mark 327, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. So repentance is much more than simply saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is realizing the behavior displeases God. It is not right. And not only being sorry, but being convicted enough to turn around and point your life in the opposite direction. That's your responsibility. That's your responsibility. You want to see generational curses broke off of your family. It starts with your repentance. Now, number one, number one, um, and we're talking here about how to break these, these curses off of our families. Number one, recognize the behavior. And I'm kind of reiterating some things that I've already stated. Recognize the behavior as unrighteous. Stop putting lipstick on a pig, man. You know, stop making excuses for this thing. Trying to, um, you know, pretty this thing up. You know, it wasn't no complicated. You, you know, people ask you, you what, what, what's, what's your relational status? Well, it was, it was complicated. It wasn't complicated. It was, it was adultery. I was, I was committing adultery and it destroyed my family. You, you, you know, you got to recognize the behavior as unrighteousness. As long as you sitting around here trying to, you know, dress this thing up, what you are doing is you're negating because God can't participate in nothing that's not true. First John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, call it what it is. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Recognize the behavior as being unrighteous. This was not right. I remember conversations I had with my father where he shared with me. You've seen daddy do this. You've seen daddy do that. None of that was right. All of that was wrong. Our daddy doesn't want you to repeat that. 
Then he modeled that lifestyle that he was now, this new lifestyle that he was promoting. He modeled a, a lifestyle of righteousness before me and my brother. This deals with exposing the darkness to the light. One of the issues we have with family curses is shame. A curse can only survive in the dark. And when we're shame, we do what? We cover it up. Not understanding that we are simultaneously providing the atmosphere for it to continue to live. Proverbs 28 and 13 says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Now the second, the second thing you need to do is to renounce the works of the devil in you and your family. Renounce these works. Stuff that you've winked at and maybe even tried to excuse. Renounce it. Renounce it. You know, even with your children, you have to be honest with them. You know, sometimes your children want you to just sugarcoat and compromise truth, but you can't compromise no truth with your children. Worst thing you can do, to be honest with you, is compromise truth, truth with your children. Now, if your children are wrong, you draw a line of distinction between you recognizing and acknowledging that their behavior is wrong from your loving them and, and, and having fellowship with them on whatever level, but if your children putting you in a position where you got to compromise what you actually believe is right just to pacify them, I mean, you, you just fertilizing that thing. At, there's a point that you just have to renounce the works of the devil in you and your family. This is of the devil. This is not right. Uh-uh. This cannot fly. Somebody has to stand up and, and draw the line of distinction between what is, what is evil or what is righteous versus what is unrighteous. As long as you sitting around there, you know, straddling the fence with all of this political correctness because you worrying about somebody, you know, uh, rejecting you. Man, I'd rather my children reject me than for them to cross over into eternity and God have to reject them. Now, if it means you got to reject me to be accepted by God. Let it be, but I'm going to renounce the works of the devil in me and my family. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 27. Wherefore, putting away, lying, put it away. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Put it away. Renounce it. Revelation chapter 12. Verses 10 and 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Got to renounce the works of the devil in you and in your family. We renounce the devil by proclaiming Christ. James chapter four, verses seven and eight says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh unto God. I like this right here. He says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. See, when you renounce the devil, God moves in closer. Cleanse your hands, your actions, your deeds, your goings, your behavior. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. Get your hearts aligned, ye double-minded. You can't straddle the fence and think you're going to break generational curses off of your family. You're going to have to renounce that thing. So number one, we said you're going to have to recognize the behavior as unrighteous. And then you're going to have to renounce the works of the devil in you and your family. Now, number three, you're going to have to repair the breach created by the curse. 
You're going to have to repair the breach created by the curse. We repair the breach by increasing the knowledge of God in our hearts. Rebuilding relationships and continuing to walk in the spirit because these generational curses have destroyed a lot of stuff. Now we have to repair the breach. Few things we need to we need to do in terms of repairing the breach created by the by the generational curse. Forgive offenders. That's a big thing in family. Family members hold a lot of grudges and a whole hold a lot of bitterness in your hearts. And you, you're wondering why the demonic seems to just have a field day in your family. It's because the spirit of offense is just like reigning and ruling in your family. Hebrews 12 and 15 says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. You got to forgive offenders, repair the breach by forgiving offenders. Number two, repent for offenses. Not only should you forgive offenders, you should repent for the things you've done to offend. Matthew 5, 23, 24. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. You have to you have to forgive offenders, repent for offenses. Next thing, raise the standard by renewing your mind by the word of God. Romans 12 and 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Raise the standard by renewing your mind by the word of God. So you have to renew your mind. When children have been born into a cursed generation, you must introduce them to Christ. Keep them under the word and keep their environment righteous. Elevate their, elevate their mindset by keeping feeding them the word of God and teaching them the principles of God's word without even using the Bible. Sometimes you have to even move beyond your children and you have to just begin to deal with your grandchildren. Proverbs 22 and six, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I love that. Now, um, when you start talking about training, you're really you're really talking about not only just teaching, but it's also giving the child the opportunity to um, to perform, to actualize the stuff you're teaching. You know, it's, it's like the difference. It's the difference between taking a football team in the locker room and showing them a play on the board versus bringing them to the field and actually training them to actually run the play. Well, we have to train our children in righteousness, not just tell them, not just teach them, but then give them opportunities to live it out. You know, that's how you begin to uproot generational curses out of the next generation, where you see them leaning, having a bent towards the things that um, model you know, the issues of the generations prior to them, you begin to teach that out of them. You introduce them to Christ. You provide a righteous model for them. And then you begin to challenge, especially when they're kids, you begin to challenge their behavior when they are going in the wrong direction and you train them in the direction of righteousness. You train them in the direction of righteousness. And that's how you raise up a righteous generation. Come on, somebody. 
Now, grown children who are seeming to follow the same line of the curse may be won, grown children, may be won only by the Holy Spirit and your loving, righteous example. You can tell your grown children you're wrong. This is not of God. But don't ever draw a line where, you know, or fail to draw a line between your assessment of their behavior versus your love for them. You got to be able to, you know, we always say it in the church, hate the sin, love the sinner. Well, how much more does that apply to your children? And then some of you out here, you got your biological children and you have a you have church folk that got you rejecting your biological children because of whatever their vice is. You know, now I understand that there are some children that, you know, you just, they, they just special and, and it's harmful and hurtful for you to even have them in your life. They're subject to do anything from physically harming you to financially ruining you. But I'm talking about folk who have children who are not a threat, but have made bad choices. And you can see where their choices are the product of, of, of a generational curse. You're not supposed to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. You, you, you win that child by loving them, with them having a clear understanding that you do not at all support or agree with their lifestyle and you will never, but that having no, nothing to do with your love for your child. Period. And then number four. Number four. Uh, number four talking about how to break these family curses. Number one, we said, recognize the behavior as unrighteous, renounce the works of the devil, repair the breaches that have been created. And then number four, redirect the thinking. Redirect the thinking. The seed of that curse is resident in your mind. I was teaching my, um, Mordecai Mission Group, which is a, a group of ladies that I mentor. It's a 12 week, it's a 12 week mentoring um, course that I come on live with them once a week, every week for 12 weeks. And I was telling them about how I have to manage my own mind. Because when you've had the kind of life that I've had, you have a lot of thoughts that try to continue to spring up. They continue to try to spring up. And you have to many times literally pull those thoughts down and you have to redirect your thinking because your thinking is off. You got to know that. Your thinking is off. Romans 12 and 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. And that term renewing, renewing literally translates as renovating or the renovation of your mind, which speaks of what? The forceful tearing out of old thoughts, mindsets and philosophies and the, re the intentional replacing with those things that are current and righteous. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, that your life might be the example of what God truly desires. You have to redirect the thinking. And then listen to what 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 says. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know what he's saying there? You're going to have to learn how to take your legal thoughts, arrest them and put them in jail. This is how you begin to, you know, overcome these generational curses. You know, the, the stuff that has been planted in your spirit. You have to begin to, you have to stop, slow your life down. Think about what you're thinking about. And anything that does not align with righteousness, pull that thing down, cast that thing down, arrest that thing, put that thing in prison, lock the door and lock that thought up. And then replace that thought with the righteous mindset of God. 
And so I, my, my prayer is that, you know, this is really ministering to you in some way. And, and I hope that you can take these things that we've shared in this lesson and apply them to your families and begin to see God break the shackles. Be patient with the process, but be diligent, be consistent, stick with it because it will work. Now, Father God, I thank you for every person that is under the sound of my voice. I thank you, dear God, for supernaturally, supernaturally, Father, glory to God, breaking the strongholds, the shackles off of their families. Every person, dear Father, every person that is struggling with issues, God, I thank you for giving them your power and your ability to rise above it. In the name of Jesus Christ, I give you praise, I give you glory, and I give you honor. Amen, 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 amen. I hope you got something out of this because I have certainly enjoyed teaching this lesson today. We here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you for spending this time with us today. today. R.C. and Lisa are always honored to have you with us. Don't forget to reach out to us by visiting our website at www.rcblakes.com. While you're there, you may join our mailing list and receive a free download of the Laws of Manifesting Your Vision by R.C. Blakes. Also look at all of the online programs by R.C. You may find all books written by R.C. and Lisa. Once again, all of us here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And as we always say, see you at the top.